good afternoon. Uh, welcome to our webinar on computational methods for collecting data from the web. Um, this is part of a larger UK data service uh, training program. Um, it's focused at uh, new forms of data that social scientists may find productive in their research and teaching. Um, so some upcoming webinars, we have uh, getting data from the internet and two more on web scraping. Uh, and we have some past webinars that focus on agent-based modeling. Uh, which is a simulation-based method uh, for social scientists. Uh, first, uh, I hope everyone is well under the current circumstances, uh, and thank you to those joining us live uh, during this challenging period. If you have any questions uh, during the course of this, as Gillian said, um, type them into the question box, and then at the end I'll read out every uh, question and answer it to the best of my ability. Uh, you may have noticed that um, Due to an understandable scheduling conflict, uh, Professor Alistair Rutherford is un uh, unable to join us. Um, luckily for you, as you'll notice, I am one of the co-authors on the paper we will be discussing, uh, so you are in capable hands. So the aim of today's webinar is to show you how we employed web scraping techniques um, to generate a new linked administrative data set to evaluate a regulatory intervention. Specifically, we looked at the causal impact of attempts by the fundraising regulator to incentivize charities to contribute to the cost of regulation. So this is quite novel in the charity sector. Usually government funds regulators. In this case, the charities were funding the regulator. And we wanted to test how effective that incentive um, was. Uh, and you can get the paper, which is recently published at this DOI, um, and the materials underpinning the paper, so the web scraper and the data analysis scripts uh, are all available in a public repository uh, also. So let's take a look at what we're going to talk about today. Um, of course, we'll describe what web scraping is as a social science research method. Uh, we'll discuss why it's valuable for social science uh, research. Specifically in the context of our paper, we'll see what problem it solved. Um, We'll also look at how we actually implemented it in practice, which programming languages did we use, how did we actually run uh, the script. And of course, most importantly, we look at the, reduce it, the results it produced for our social science project. Uh, and we'll also make some general reflections uh, and critical uh, points about web scraping uh, itself as a social science research method. Um, I'll answer your questions and I'll point you to some further uh, learning and teaching resources uh, in this area um, also. So what is uh, web scraping? Well, firstly, it's a computational technique for capturing information uh, stored on a web page. Computational is the key word here because it is possible, as I'm sure you're aware, to manually collect data from a web page. You can highlight the words, the paragraphs, you can right click on the image and save to your uh, machine. However, performing this task manually uh, carries some considerable disadvantages, uh, as I'll show you uh, in our specific example. Web scraping is generally implemented using a programming script. By that I mean some executable code that's written in a programming language, so R or Python, Java, C Sharp, uh, etc. So there are software applications uh, on the market that you can use to do the web scraping for you. Um, in a future webinar, we'll show you how you can use Excel to perform a web scraping task. Um, but to have full flexibility and power, you're going to use a, web, uh, a programming language and you're going to write your own code. It is relatively simple to implement web scraping techniques using open source programming uh, languages. You do not need to be highly computationally literate. Uh, you don't need to write screeds of code. Web scraping is quite a common task uh, in computational social science with lots of documentation and lots of examples for you to learn from. So if you're feeling apprehensive at the outset, web scraping is a great entryway into computational social science. So I'll show you an example uh, from our research area, which is uh, the charitable sector here in the UK. Uh, we have a, a regulator of charities, the Charity Commission for England and Wales. Uh, and every month they provide a data extract. So this is a census of all registered charities. Um, it also has their financial information uh, and lots of other organizational um, characteristics. 
Now that data download is useful uh, and it is uh, used for productive research on the sector, but there is an abundance of extra information available um, elsewhere. So I can show you. So for example, the Charity Commission has a public facing uh, website. So I'm just looking at a sample charity here, which is Oxfam. Uh, I'm sure it'll be a familiar organization. Um, we have an overview page. We have some financial information. We can see the charity's documents, its annual reports that it submits. We can get a list of trustees, and we can see where that charity operates uh, globally. Now, why do we need this website? Well, in the data extract, we do have a lot of the information that's available here in the overview. So we can get its unique ID, we can figure out what type of activities it undertakes, and we can understand who the charity helps uh, also. However, some really valuable information that we might be interested in would be the trustees of the organization. And as we can see here, it also lists which other organizations a trustee uh, is on the board of. And that's a, a fantastically interesting piece of information. We can look at networks of trustees. What do the networks look like uh, amongst the most successful charities, charities that get into trouble, uh, etc. cetera. And the financial information is also um, available in the data extract, but the actual documents themselves um, are not. So if we wanted to perform some text analysis of how a charity reports on its annual performance, we would need those documents um, themselves. So we've got a public website, we've got a data extract, um, so if we want to build a complete picture, a complete understanding of the charity sector, we need to collect data from multiple uh, sources. So as I said, we could collect this data manually, um, we could go to Oxfam, we could right click on each of these um, links to the PDFs, we could download them to our machine and we could do some content analysis or some sentiment uh, analysis. But what if we're not just interested in Oxfam and we're interested in all humanitarian charities in England and Wales, or we're interested in all 160,000 registered charities uh, in England and Wales. Uh, therefore, we need a different approach, um, and that's where web scraping uh, comes in. So why collect data from the web? So I've hopefully given you um, some reasons to do it. Web pages themselves are a really important source of publicly available information. Uh, on social phenomena of interest. Unfortunately, the, the current uh, COVID-19 public health crisis is an excellent case in point. Um, the UK government has a dedicated website with some daily updates on actions individuals can take. The World Health Organization has a very informative website, also produces daily PDFs um, known as situation reports. So web pages themselves um, do contain very, very rich uh, and research um, valuable uh, information that we might want to get a hold of. And as I've shown as well, web pages can store a range of different data types, uh, including files, text, photos, videos, lists, uh, etc., all which may be collected and marshaled for research purposes. And finally, once collected, the data can be reshaped into familiar uh, formats. Data that's stored on a website um, will be in an unfamiliar format. It'll be in something called HTML. Um, but it is possible, using programming techniques, to reshape that into a CSV file, for instance, and then link it to other sources um, of social science uh, data. So the research problem we had uh, that we thought web scraping would um, help us solve is the fundraising regulator for England and Wales. Uh, it's a statutory regulator of fundraising activities. So a charity that operates a shop um, and sells goods to raise money for the organization, or if you give money by direct debit uh, to a charity, those activities are now regulated um, by the fundraising regulator. And this is a fairly new development since 2016. Uh, it came in the wake of some prominent fundraising scandals that some of you may remember. Um, these were aggressive uh, targeting of donors. There was questionable data sharing practices amongst the larger charities. Um, so there's a need for statutory regulation uh, in this area. As I said previously, the regulator is partly funded by the charities and organizations it oversees. 
this is quite novel uh, globally for charities, uh, for the charity sector. Um, and of course, it opens up uh, opportunities for regulatory capture um, also. So organizations are not compelled, so there's no legal mandate um, to take money from charities to cover the cost of regulation. Uh, however, the regulator does expect certain types of organizations uh, to pay a fee. So those organizations are the ones that spend £100,000 or more on raising funds uh, for these for their organizations. So if you think of some of the, the largest, most successful fundraising uh, charities, you've got Cancer Research UK, Macmillan, for example, they spend quite a lot of money um, justifiably raising funds so that the charity can carry out um, its activities. So what the regulator did was say, for those charities that it expects to contribute, they would threaten to name and shame those organizations um, if they didn't pay this voluntary fee. So they were trying to put some um, pressure, they were trying to incentivize certain organizations um, to pay that fee. So in our research project, we were interested in evaluating how successful uh, this attempt to incentivize payment of the fee uh, was, which presented us with our core uh, challenge collecting data on which charities have and have not paid um, this fee. So first method, which is requesting data from the regulator directly, um, they were very helpful. They provided us with a PDF file of all the charities that had paid the fee at the time we made the request, which was a couple of years ago. So however, the list already contained over a thousand records, um, which would require considerable manual input um, to extract the list of charities from the PDF and put it in a tabular data format into a CSV file. And this also meant that our list was essentially out of date once it was transferred um, to us. Uh, therefore, we needed a different uh, method to get a hold uh, of the data. So the fundraising regulator um, operates a public uh, website um, and it lists a directory of all the charities that have paid uh, this voluntary fee. Uh, and they also list expect to pay the fee but haven't and these are listed uh, in red. So for example, um, alphabetically we can see these are charities here in the UK um, who have paid the levy. And they're across a, a range of different sizes. So there's a small charities, uh, there are large charities. So Aberystwyth University here has paid the uh, levy fee as well. And how this is structured is we have multiple web pages as a list of charities that have paid uh, the fee. And each individual charity has its own page um, also. So for this organization here, above and beyond, we can see it's a large charity, it's paid. And the crucial second piece of information we need is its registered charity number also, because then that allows us to link back to the open data that's made available by the Charity Commission for England and Wales. So the problem is relatively simple to map out. We have a list of web pages. We have certain pieces of text information on those web pages. We would like to scrape and we would like to export into a more usable format, link to existing data and perform our analysis. So let's take a look at the, the logic and skills behind uh, web scraping as a general uh, technique. So we begin with a web page uh, that contains information we are interested in collecting. Therefore, we need to know the following. We need to know the location, which is also known as the URL or web address, where the web page can be accessed. So as I showed you uh, previously, the directory can be accessed at the fundraising regulator.org.uk forward slash directory web address. Once we know that, we then have to locate the information on the web page um, that we are interested in collecting. So where on that directory page was the information about whether it was a large charity, whether it had paid, and its charity number. So then we need to find uh, that information as well. Once we know those two pieces of information, then we need to do the following. We need to request the web page using the URL. Manually, uh, that's equivalent to you just going into a web browser, copy and pasting in the URL and pressing enter, and the website then should appear in your browser. But we need to do that using a programming language. 
once we request the URL, we need to parse the structure of the web page so your programming language can work with its contents. As I said previously, a web page is, is written in a language called HTML, uh, which uses tags to delineate the elements that make up a page. So for example, there are tags that identify tables on web pages, there are tags that identify paragraphs and links and images, um, etc. So you need to tell your programming language that we're working with a website. Once it knows that, then it can navigate the tags and it can extract the information that you are interested in. So for us with the fundraising regulator, we are looking for a paragraph tag or a P tag and we want to extract the text in between those P tags that give us the registered charity number and its levy payment uh, status. And finally, we want to write this information uh, to a file for future use. So we want to extract the text, we want to format it in a tabular uh, format and then we want to export that, save it as a CSV file or an Excel file or a .txt file um, that we can use uh, at a later date. So with these general uh, principles uh, in mind for any web scrape, specific to us, um, we needed a programming script uh, that will do the following. So we needed to iterate or loop through a list of web pages and extract the charity number um, and its levy status. So we needed the unique ID of an organization and whether it had uh, paid or not. And we needed to perform this task on a routine basis. So for us, we wanted to schedule this programming script to run on a monthly basis so we could get up-to-date lists of who had paid the, the levy. So we can take a, a quick look at the code itself. Um, and as I said, we will be releasing this code uh, in a public repository quite soon. Um, make that look a bit bigger for you. So what we decided to do was write a web scraper in the Python programming language. Um, Python is a general purpose, easy to learn, open source programming language. Um, by general purpose, you can use it to create a web scraper, you can use it to create a website, an app, uh, host the website. It's, it's a general purpose programming uh, language. It's easy to learn because it's high level and what that means is that it uses uh, it's English language based in terms of its variable names, its function names, uh, how you write it is a bit more like how you, you would write um, English, which is good. Uh, and it's open source, it's free to download uh, and it's free to change as well if you're so uh, inclined. So our scraper uh, specifically, as you can see up here, it only requires three separate packages or modules, um, so it doesn't require lots of downloading additional um, packages. It uses a set of core Python packages to perform this task. Here's the pieces of information we need to know. We need to know the website um, where the information can be accessed from um, and then we need to a then we need to create a oh, apologies. Yeah. So what we do then next is once we know the URL that we're scraping, we do some project administration. So we create a new output file. So we create a new CSV file containing these headers. So the charity ID, the charity name, what kind of regulatory type it is, etc. So at the beginning of our scrape, we set up an output file that we can write all of the uh, scraped information um, to. Once we open that file, what we do then is we construct the, the web address, so that's a base URL plus the uh, web page uh, we're interested in scraping. And as you can see on the fundraising regulators website, you know, page one had 20 or so charities, page two had 20 or so charities, etc. So we loop over those page uh, numbers. This very small piece of code here um, is, the, is the command that actually requests the web page, so that's again equivalent to you going into your browser and saying, you know, give me this uh, web page. So Python does that for you in a very simple, concise uh, way. Then we need to parse the web page. So basically here we say, take the uh, web page that we just requested and tell Python that it's, a, it's an HTML uh, structure. And once it's in an HTML structure, then we can start accessing the tags and the information uh, that we need. So 
we, this will be shared with you at a future date, so we don't need to go into it in too much detail. But essentially, we're going through elements in the page. Um, so we're looking for an element called charity title, and then we're scraping the text uh, from that element. So that gives us the charity name, for example. Uh, and this is doing something similar. If we find a list, if it's a registered charity, we cycle through the list and we pull out the information uh, we need. Um, and then right here at the very end, once we've collected all the information we need, um, we use a writer command in Python and we export all that information to the file we created um, earlier. So what we get at the end is a CSV file uh, with one row per organization that we find on the web page and we have its charity ID, its charity name, uh, and whether it paid the uh, levy or not. So I realize it, it's it's better, obviously, to run this code. So in the future uh, webinars, we will be showing you how to actually execute this code, uh, and you can follow along. Uh, but for now, just while we're tidying up this project, uh, we said we'd give you a look at the code, how we did it, um, but you'll also be able to see for yourself uh, quite soon uh, what we did. And we saved uh, and shared all of this work uh, on a publicly available repository, uh, which I'll show you in a moment um, as well. So what was the point of all of this? Well, we had a social science uh, research project. We had what we thought was an important question. The whole point was to generate data that can produce uh, some insightful um, results. So we took that scraped data uh, in the CSV file and we linked it to financial data uh, from that data extract I showed you earlier. And this gives us about 4,000 organizations um, on which we have detailed financial information. So these are the 4,000 uh, that spend a certain amount uh, that therefore we know exactly what they spent on their fundraising costs uh, for a given year. What we did then is we exploited the sharp threshold by fundraising expenditure. So remember the regulator said if you spend 100,000 pounds or more, you're expected to contribute to the cost of regulation. What that gives us is a research design uh, known as regression discontinuity, uh, which is a, a quasi-experimental research design. Uh, and regression discontinuity is suitable uh, when a cutoff point is used to allocate units to a treatment or an intervention or not. So 100,000 pounds was set as a threshold if you're above that threshold, you're expected to pay. If you're below that threshold, you're not expected to pay, but of course you can um, if you want. What makes it a quasi-experimental research design is charities could not manipulate precisely which side of the threshold they fell on. Uh, very wisely, the fundraising regulator decided to use the 2014 set of accounts uh, in order to set the threshold so charities could not go back two years into the past and amend their accounts to ensure they don't uh, fall on the £100,000 side uh, of the threshold. What that means is that close to this threshold, charities um, around this threshold are essentially very similar uh, with one difference which is one fell on one side uh, and one didn't. So for example, an organisation that spent £90,000 on fundraising is very similar to one that spent £110,000 with the crucial exception of the latter being uh, expected to make a voluntary contribution and the former not expected. So we conducted the analysis in Stata using the RD Robust package by Colonico et al. Um, so I encourage you to check that out. It's a very good package, um, very well documented. So you can see in this in this project, we've combined Python uh, and Stata uh, quite easily without much extra work uh, at all. So what kind of uh, findings did we produce? Well, first, uh, there's a clear correlation between what you spend on fundraising and the probability of paying uh, the voluntary fee. Um, so if you look at the x-axis, if you spend between zero and a hundred thousand pounds, um, the probability of paying that fee is about 20%. So about 20% of organizations within that fundraising expenditure band um, paid the fee, even though they were not subject to being uh, named and shamed by the regulator. Um, but we can see at the threshold, uh, there's a considerable jump or discontinuity uh, in the regression line. So above the threshold, about 60, 65% uh, of organizations paid the fee. 
And it's that discontinuity between the two regression lines that gives us our estimate of the causal uh, impact of the threat to name and shame. If we expected the, the threat to be ineffective, what we would see is the trend line uh, left of the threshold carrying across uh, over the threshold and onto the, the right-hand side of the x-axis. But instead, we see a, a big jump just at the threshold, um, which corresponds to the regulator's threat to name and shame. So we, we do get some quite convincing evidence that the regulator's uh, threat to name and shame was very successful in getting charities to pay this voluntary um, fee. And how successful was it? Well, we could use the uh, we can use the results of the regression discontinuity um, to make predictions of what would have happened if they didn't um, threaten to name and shame. So, the top gray line is exactly what they raised from charities. It was just shy of 1.7 million in its first year, and we can see that the probability of paying uh, increases again the more you spend uh, on fundraising. If we made a very naive assumption that just at the left of the threshold, uh, where the line cuts the vertical line, that's about 20%. If we carry that across, we would have expected the regulator to raise about 400,000. That's obviously unrealistic because we know that the probability does increase um, with how much you spend. So basically, if we can carry the upward trend line on the left-hand side over to the right, we would have expected the regulator to raise about just shy of £800,000. So we conservatively estimate that this threat to name and shame covered about half of the regulator's budget. If they didn't do that, they would have had half the money available to them uh, for regulation in its first year. That introduces lots and lots of interesting um, substantive um, reflections. Is this, a, is this an approach that will be successful going forward if every year the regulator has to say, you can be named and shamed um, for not contributing to the cost of regulation. I'm not sure that's a, a successful long-term uh, approach, but as a one-off intervention, it does look to be a, a very successful uh, approach. Charities do seem to be concerned with their reputation, therefore they will pay this voluntary levy to avoid negative reputational uh, damage. So let's summarize um, some of the pros and cons of web scraping in our context, but also just more generally uh, for social scientists. So I think hopefully one of the major pros, and it's probably difficult for you to divine just me showing you some code, but when you actually get to interact with code, as we'll show you in future webinars, it is a skill that's relatively easy to learn. And web scraping can be performed in you know, 30, 40 lines uh, of code all of which is very um, accessible and available online. Web scraping is a very easy to routinize or automate um, method. So this is particularly important when data are continuously updated. So in our example, um, if a charity stopped paying the levy, it would disappear from the website and we wouldn't have, <clears throat> we wouldn't have a longitudinal data set where we capture uh, the charity's participation. It just simply would not appear on the website um, anymore. So for us, we schedule the script to run every month, um, but if it was particularly important, if we were talking again, unfortunately, about the coronavirus um, health crisis, it's incredibly fast moving. If you wanted to collect data, you might have to run daily um, uh, versions of your web scraper as well. And it's not it's not too difficult to do that, um, and we can talk about uh, approaches for scheduling uh, programming scripts. Just thinking about social science in general, um, there's lots of public sector bodies, lots of charitable bodies, um, share data through their websites. So, if you want to get a hold of annual reports, um, kind of up, you know monthly statistics and figures, you're probably going to have to go to a website. Um, you probably won't be lucky enough to go to a a data portal and to get some nice, clean, formatted open data ready to be imported into Stata or SPSS or R, for example. Um, so while that poses a challenge, uh, the good thing is there's incredibly rich information out there stored on websites um, that can be productively used uh, in your research. And it's also quite easy to format data scraped from a web page. It looks messy. It looks like paragraphs and images and tables, etc. But as our example showed, it can be easily formatted to permit data linkage. 
you might be interested in local authority statistics, you could go to your local authorities uh, website, you could scrape some of that information, and then it might be possible to use a postcode field to link to a large-scale social survey, for example. Of course, it's not all singing and dancing. There are considerable ethical issues, um, particularly around uh, personal data. So as you saw in our example, we can scrape information about trustees. Um, that is publicly available information. But of course, thanks to uh, GDPR, it means even if it's publicly available, as soon as I scrape and download personal data, I have a responsibility for how it's processed. Um, so that does bring me into the realm of you know, data protection um, and, of course, getting ethical clearance for doing such research. Web scraping may also contravene the terms of use of a website. Um, lots of websites don't want you scraping. Um, they might not explicitly stop you, but it will be in the terms and conditions of using a website. You may not scrape this information, repackage it share it uh, onwards, etc. So you do need to be quite diligent and you do need to read um, the terms and conditions on a website uh, to avoid uh, getting into trouble. Probably another obvious con is if the structure of the web page uh, changes, um, your script can stop working. Um, currently actually with the fundraising regulator they've just made a change and we've had to um, update the script, hence why it's not available on the public repository we have just now and um, we need to get it working again because it's been two years uh, since we first collected the uh, data. Of course as well some websites are up to uh, quite up to speed and they can actually blacklist you so they can ban uh, you from scraping the data so your computer has a unique ID when it connects to the internet that's known as its IP address a website can just block your IP address and not even let you request the page, never mind interact with it, you won't even see the web page. Um, so some websites are advanced enough uh, to do that. Others may allow you to scrape the web page, but they may put some kind of throttling in place where you can only request the web page once every 30 seconds, um, or you may only be able to interact with it uh, in, a certain, uh, in a certain way. It also requires good internet connectivity for uh, extended periods of time. There are ways around that, um, but I'm sure, like me, your university laptop is tightly controlled by IT services. Um, it can be difficult to leave it open for more than 20 minutes before it goes into sleep mode, for example. There are ways around this. You can have your own personal server, for example, um, but it's worth bearing in mind that if you have a very intensive long-running script you need to have a think about your computer setup um, as well. So thank you very much uh, for joining us and um, I really appreciate giving up your time uh, particularly uh, at a period like uh, this. So I can see some questions uh, coming in and uh, so I'm going to read those out uh, one by one because I'm guessing you can't uh, see those. Uh, so the first question, um, is there an alternative package in R? Uh, yes, there is. That's a really good point. Um, you should be quite agnostic about the programming language you want to use. If you're an R user, absolutely, you can do all of this uh, in R. You can do all of your uh, text mining in R. You can do all of your um, connecting to the Twitter API in R, absolutely. For us, we began with Python, so we've continued to use it. Um, but the techniques are, are very similar, um, so absolutely, I'm not advocating uh, Python, it works well, but if you want to use R, uh, you absolutely um, can. Uh, we had a question as well about which part of your code was for scheduling, uh, that's very good. In the snippet I showed you, we didn't have this, the scheduling code. What we did is we have a slightly more advanced version of the script, um, that script is kept on a Raspberry Pi. Um, which I'm sure some of you have heard of. That's basically a very small, portable, uh, personal computer. Um, you can leave the Raspberry Pi on all day, every day, and so that's what we did. We moved the script to a Raspberry Pi, uh, and then we basically scheduled the script to run um, once a month um, as well. And we also had, on the side of this, we had a Twitter bot, which after every scrape would start saying, these are the new charities that have just paid uh, the levy as well. So you can also connect your script to uh, Twitter or Facebook updates if you want to do some kind of um, <clears throat> kind of knowledge exchange or some public information uh, using your scraped uh, data as well. 
And we have a question about to what extent does the speaker rely on UK copyright law to scrape uh, and reuse and store the data? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, as I've mentioned, GDPR applies when you're scraping um, personal data, but of course copyright law does apply as well um, to the scraped information. Which brings you back to my point that websites will have a terms of use, uh, and if you read the terms of use, um, then that should give you an idea of what uh, further uses and repurposing uh, you can make of the information provided um, on a web page. Um, so yeah, I, I, as a general principle, um, don't create a web scraper and then figure out whether you're allowed to do that. Um, read the documentation uh, on the website. Uh, us specifically because we contacted the fundraising regulator um, to get data in the first place we did clear our uh, web scraping activities uh, with them so they were fine with the with the use of, of data we have a question about can you scrape all kinds of website and um, like social media pages for example um, excellent question tentatively Yes, if it's a if the website is available at a URL, so if you can type that web address in, um, and it'll appear on your browser, then yes, you can write a scraper. With social media web pages, um, they provide a different approach, which is to use an online database, and then you're allowed write code that connects to that online um, database. So you don't actually have to scrape the page. There's a database that contains public available information that you can write code um, to access. So that's a really good point as well. You don't always have to use um, web scraping. And being brutally honest, um, it always helps to contact the website owner first and say, can I actually have this data as a zip file? That might save you quite a lot of trouble uh, in the long term as well. We have a question here. Uh, do you advocate using a Jupyter notebook since you are using both Python and Stata? Uh, yes, so for those of you who are unaware, a Jupyter Notebook is a, an electronic document that allows you to mix uh, live code, the results of that code, uh, and some narrative information as well. So it brings together basically your state of syntax file with your journal article, um, to put it simply. Um, in the next two webinars, we'll be covering how to use Jupyter Notebooks uh, to perform web scraping. So um, hopefully if you can join us in April, I'll actually provide you with a Jupyter notebook that you can run yourself uh, to perform your web scraping. Um, but yes, as a general principle, it's good to keep all of your work in one portable, transparent document uh, that you can share. I have a question here about what about MATLAB? Um, what about it? <laughs> no, of course. I haven't used MATLAB for web scraping, so I can't say for certain if it allows you to perform uh, that functionality, I'm a, I'll, I'll have a look. Um, feel free to contact me directly. Um, my details are on the page, and I will I will look that up for you. That's no trouble. Uh, out of curiosity, how long did it take to collect the data through web scraping for this paper? I'll interpret that as in a broader sense of how long it took to to write the code. Um, two years ago, when universities were on strike about our pensions, was uh, the two-week block when we learned how to do this. So it took us about two weeks to learn Python. In terms of the scrape itself, um, it's it's reasonably quick. Uh, if we're talking, uh, you know, if we're talking about a thousand organizations split across 25 web pages, uh, you're talking about maybe a script that takes a minute to two minutes to run. Um, it doesn't take very long. Um, that's because you don't actually have to kind of stagger your scraping. Um, but if you connect to an online database or an API, for example, usually you do need to stagger um, your requesting of the information. So uh, collecting data from a database can take quite a bit longer. Um, from a website, it can be reasonably, reasonably quick. You won't need to leave your laptop on and go do something else um, for 20 minutes. A very interesting question. Any extra considerations for using this technique with private sector companies? So is this private sector companies performing the web scraping or is this scraping information from a private company's website? 
if it's scraping from a private company's website, that probably brings you into a bit more ethical issues. The terms of use probably explicitly ban scraping that website, so you do need to be careful. If it's a private sector company performing the web scraping, then similar to academic use, I mean, as long as you're complying with the terms of use of the website, you're complying with copyright law, and you're complying with GDPR, then yes, you're perfectly entitled to uh, perform uh, web scraping. Excellent. And we've had, again, similar questions about people who prefer R. Um, if you use R, absolutely uh, use that. Um, you can use Stata, for example. Stata has a, um, a new web scraping functionality in uh, version 16. I haven't used it myself, um, but when I get that version, uh, I'll absolutely try it as well. So, Broadly speaking, this is a research method you can employ across multiple programming languages or even things like Stata um, and SAS, uh, for example. And again, is there an ethics code for web scraping? I mean, that's an excellent point. I don't think there is a specific document I've seen that says, here are best principles for web scraping. Um, one might exist. Uh, if one doesn't exist, I think I will put something together. That's a really excellent um, point. <clears throat> so how easy or difficult is it to debug uh, um, your web scraping uh, code? Um, it's, it's reasonably easy. Um, if you think there's an issue with your code, you can insert try accept clauses, so you can try to do something, and if it doesn't happen, you can tell the, the programming script to print out an error and tell you what's what's going wrong. Um, and you can also very simply say, <clears throat> at each stage of the each stage of the scrape, and um, print what's happening. So you can have lots of print statements, which which you know um, show uh, the results on your screen. Uh, it can show you how successfully the script is performing. So. Um, debugging is is reasonably easy. It's not a it's not a very difficult computational task uh, in that sense. Uh, this is a really good point as well. What if the information is in a PDF and you want to actually write a scraper and um, to extract the information from the PDF? <coughs> Excuse me. Yes, that's entirely possible. Um, in Python, there's a PDF converter uh, package. I think it's called. Um, that will actually um, understand the structure of a PDF and it'll extract uh, the contents. <clears throat> Excuse me. So yes, absolutely, you can um, use web scraping to collect information from within a document as well. So it's not, I suppose, web scraping, but it's, it's using scraping techniques to extract information from PDF files. Yeah, and a similar, similar question, I think, uh, that we had previously, can you apply web scraping um, to social media websites? Not web scraping itself, but you can write very similar code that connects to the online databases um, <clears throat> of these companies. So Facebook, Instagram, uh, Spotify, Wikipedia, The Guardian, uh, these all have online databases called APIs uh, that you can download data from. So it's not scraping, um, it's requesting information from online databases, uh, and our webinar on the 30th of April um, goes into detail on how you would do that um, as well. Uh, <clears throat> nearing the end, um, what are the benefits of using coding uh, against, I think, pre-existing um, software packages? So yes, so as I said, Excel has some functionality for collecting data from a website. Um, there are lots of web scraping um, programs that you can download from the internet. For me, because it's a relatively simple task to learn, uh, I think it's worth writing the code yourself and then having the flexibility to adapt it and to control when it is executed and to update it when websites change. Um, I'm, I'm a big advocate of writing the code yourself, if even if it's just for the intellectual dexterity that it produces in you. You know, coding is a very challenging but rewarding um, task and I think it's worth engaging in in general. Yeah, and then final question I think, so can you link web scraping with sentiment analysis? Uh, absolutely, web scraping is a data collection technique. Once you've collected the data <coughs> and put it into a, CS, a CSV file for example, you can import that file into, well for me, Python um, and I would use the NLTK package to perform some text mining and some sentiment analysis. Um, I think it's text miner in the R software package. Um, 
So absolutely, if you can think of web scraping as a data collection social science method, um, which can then be used to produce data for text mining, sentiment analysis, network analysis, um, conventional quantitative statistical modeling approaches, etc. cetera, um, absolutely. Okay, one more, one more. I'll be good to you. So how flexible can the programs be if you're scraping from a number of web pages in different formats? <clears throat> That's a good question. Um, usually websites are built, so the web pages of a website will be built with the same um, file extension, so they will all be HTML files, for example. Um, but of course, some pages might be different. A, a web page that has a piece of functionality in it um, might have a different file extension, for example. Um, so yes, absolutely, there can be some challenging situations where if you need to scrape five web pages, they all have a different file extension. It may be, it may be slightly trickier to request those web pages and then scrape them. So, um, yes, yeah, it, it can. It's not a, it's not a problem I've faced, um, but it's certainly something that might um, be possible. Uh, yep, yeah, and uh, finally, <laughs> one more. Can we use web scraping for qualitative data? Absolutely. In fact, it's probably most useful for collecting qualitative data. So for us, I know we collected um, the charity number and whether it paid the levy or not, but those were pieces of text information. You know, we didn't scrape anything that was a number, for example. Um, everything that we scraped, uh, you scrape it as a string, you know, as a series of characters. Um, so absolutely, you could scrape entire paragraphs, entire web pages of text, and save those um, for content analysis at a future at a future point. Um, yes, absolutely. It's probably particularly good for qualitative um, information. <clears throat> uh, and your follow-up question, yeah, is there a bibliography? Yes, on the 23rd of April in the next web scraping uh, seminar that I'm going to host, I'm going to show you how to actually do it. You can follow along um, and I will uh, suggest um, lots of additional reading and some excellent resources. So yeah, don't worry about that. Um, excellent. So I will show you a couple of uh, links that you may find useful. Um, so we've got a public repository uh, with the UK Data Service and um, where you can find the materials uh, underpinning this and future webinars. Um, quite shortly, we will be um, publishing this webinar on our YouTube channel, so you could watch again if you fancy. Um, you can also reach out uh, and help, uh, ask, ask some help of us. Um, you can also just contact me directly. I'm happy to answer uh, further questions, or you can get in contact in general with UK Data Service. Um, we're on Twitter, uh, we're on Facebook. Um, I can show you that uh, repository really quickly. Yeah, uh, hopefully you can see this. So at the UK Data Service uh, GitHub page, and we now have a new forms of data um, repository. Um, so for example, for the web scraping series, we have three uh, webinars. Um, you can find details about e each webinar, and then you can find the resources underpinning them as well. So the slides from today are currently up. And for the future webinars, I'll be posting bibliographies, um, Python uh, programming scripts that you can amend yourself, and um, yeah, reading lists, etc. So we'll be publishing lots of um, self-directed materials here uh, over the next couple of weeks. So please join us. <clears throat>